Amen. Sister Myers gave me permission over there to just let it rip, she said. She said, tear it up. You got to remember, I'm, my mind sometimes think crazy stuff, you know. <laughs> when she said that, it made me think about we were in high school. I won't tell you, somebody, somebody she knew wasn't me. Somebody spit Copenhagen dip in her hair, and she looked at me and she said, "Get him." <laughs> I had just bought a brand new pair of work boots. Boy, I tore them boots all up that day on the concrete. Me and another man going at it. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna get it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 5. If you got it, you can stand to your feet, get ready to hear the word of God this morning. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse number 5. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, beginning. Still got a few few folks getting there this morning. It's between Genesis and Revelation. If you got it, say praise the Lord. You just do like I used to do. You just find a page. It might be in Zechariah chapter something. And you just look down at your Bible, pretend like you're there. <laughs> Some of y'all, y'all know you done done it. All right, here we go. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. I want to read that verse again. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they are gone far from me and have walked after, say that word with me, vanity, and are become, say that word, vain. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death? Through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. It was a pretty bad place, wasn't it? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. In other words, the things that you've chose to do have even affected the kids coming up behind you. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Shittim and see, and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods? Let me show you what the Lord's trying to tell them here. These other nations that aren't worshiping false gods, they're more, they're more dedicated to their false gods than y'all are to the real God. Listen to what he said. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. 
Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Now look at verse number 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to preach for a while on this subject title of vanity and leaking cisterns. Vanity and leaking cisterns. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord and pray the Lord will help you, Pastor, this morning and help you. Father, this morning we're grateful for another service, another opportunity and privilege to share the Word of God and most of all to receive the Word. God, if the Word is received and applied, I believe that it will bring forth great fruit in our lives. It will impact the lives of others that we live with and people that we work with and people that are around us. I pray that this message will challenge us to a place of depth where that we will serve you with greater fervency, with a passion, that our roots be deeper than they've ever been before. If we have become stagnant, if we have become stale, I pray God challenge us that we get back where we need to be and let the fire of our love burn bright again, and we'll praise you, and everyone can say amen. I want to jump right into our text this morning without a lot of uh, talk. I I just want to get right into this. There are a few things that you and I can see from the text that we have read this morning, things that have brought about this rebuke from the The one that stands out to me the most of all the different things that we can see as we look at this particular text is the fact that something has changed about God's people. Something has changed with God's people. If you look at this text, you'll see that there's a a shift with these folks because the one that stands out to me the most when I read it is the obvious fact that something changed with the way they viewed God, the way they treated God. Something has changed about these people that once really loved God, who really served God with all of their heart. After all, you got to think of the text in context and understand these are people that have gone into the promised land. They got there because they were the generation that God was able to uh, purify through the process of the wilderness and get the ones out that really loved the Lord and go ahead and take them on into the promised land. But I want you to see that this change in their uh, life is one that has taken place through a transition. If you can see these people going from the wilderness wanderings to the abiding in the completion of God's promise, in the promised land, I want you to see that through this transition from the wilderness to this Canaan land experience that there has been a change in the people. Have you ever watched somebody that when God blessed them, they changed? This means yes. You ever seen somebody that God really touched their life and they changed? When they were poor and they were broke, they loved God, they would serve God, they were fervent, and they had a passion for God. I don't know, I can't say this statistically, I can't prove it by fact, but in my personal observation, one of the things that I have taken note of since I've been serving the Lord, that some of the most dedicated, consecrated to God people that I have ever met or been acquainted with, have pastored, are some of the poorest people you will ever meet. Those are sometimes the people that know they have to depend on God. It's sometimes the most wealthy people. I'm not saying that all wealthy people don't have a relationship with God, 
But sometimes people will let the wealth and the bounty of blessing and the reward and success of life become the pinnacle of everything that they live for and they no longer live for God. Have you ever seen somebody that has changed when they got blessed? They're not the same person that they used to be. Well, verse five tells us what that something was about the people that changed. Verse five said, thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and become vain. So you hear for yourself this morning the very thing, if God was to write out the recipe or the formula by which that they changed, we just read it. They have gone far away from me and they have done that by walking after or pursuing vanity and they have become a vain people. You see, their change was in the fact that they went from being what we would consider a meek and an unpretentious people to a people that God calls vain, a people who are in pursuit of things that are of vanity. Now, how does that even happen? Well, I'm going to first assume that most of us may not understand fully what the definition of the word vanity means. So I want you to see for yourself what exactly it means to be vain. And I'm going to share you the actual definition of it. To be vain or vanity is to be or have an excessive opinion of oneself. It is also namely in a person's wealth, their worth, or their appearance. To become vain or to be a person of vanity is to be someone that is excessively opinionated about their self, elevated in themselves about their wealth, their worth, or their appearance. While some of these people have chosen to maybe place emphasis on a vanity uh, in, the, in the church world today because of an outward appearance, I want you to see a very different side of vanity. What are you saying, Pastor Myers? Well, I have learned as long as I've been saved that a lot of preachers in a lot of church circles like to place all the emphasis on a person being vain on their outward appearance. But how many of you know that there's a lot more about, about being vain than about your outward appearance? Say amen, somebody. You see, some of the most vain people that I have personally met since I've been in church are the ones that place all their excessive, high, opinionated self on their brand or their formula for holiness. Some of them are what I would call religiously vain. So while they may not wear red ruby lipstick or maybe they may not wear what some call ear bobs or maybe they don't do their hair up and they look like they need to brush their hair. Amen. Because they look like they're plain as soap. All of that, that can become vain in itself because what happens is that you think that your brand is better and higher than anybody else. Well, look at me. I don't go here. I don't go there. I don't do this. I don't hang around these people and while there are people that have good intentions and good convictions and I admire that and respect that you've got to be careful that you don't become religiously vain you see vain a vain person is referred to also at times as someone that is egotistical someone that is prideful someone that is arrogant and someone that is selfish you see, none of these traits that I just told you of, this egotistical, prideful, arrogant, and selfish trait, none of these are God-centered, but instead, these are all self-centered traits. These are not the character or the fruit of the Spirit. If you agree, say amen. So what does all of this mean when it comes to the Israelite people in our text? Well, simply put, for those that prefer preaching in just plain everyday English, what I'm saying is they shifted their focus away from God and focus became about self. Their focus went from being about 
God, pleasing God, spiritual things to everything is about me and about what pleases me, what pleases my little family. You see, their lives had become one where they were living to please self all the time and whatever made me happy. And it didn't matter whether or not God approved of their choices, uh, their sinful choices. Uh, they didn't care what God thought about it. As long as it makes me happy, who cares what God thinks? It doesn't matter if God thinks that it's not right for me to say this, do that, talk about that, talk about this. It doesn't matter as long as it pleases me. You are becoming, slowly becoming vain in your approach. You see, there are people that I've met that their attitude, whether they ever say this with their lips or not, their attitude is almost like, well, I'm going to live the way I want to live, do what makes me happy, and God's just going to have to deal with it. And if God ain't happy with that, then I don't know what to tell God. But I want you to see that throughout this text, we are reading of the various ways that God has implied that this people have forgotten about God. I want you to see how that they that God points out, you have forgotten that I'm the one responsible for bringing you out of bondage. I'm the one responsible for keeping you alive in the desert's adverse conditions. You see, the Bible pointed out how bad the desert was. The desert didn't have any inhabitants in it until God brought the people in it. And God said somehow or another him and nobody wanted to live in the desert because you can't survive in the desert but I kept you alive in the desert. If that don't speak anything about God then I don't know what was. God made sure that they were fed. God made sure they were clothed. God made sure they had everything that they had. But God said now that you're blessed and now that you're in the land of promise and you got bounty and plenty now you don't know who I am anymore somebody say God would you help us ultimately God said you have also forgot how that you I brought you into the land of promise and plenty you're forgetting that I'm the reason you're in the place you're in you're forgetting that I'm the one that you're so you're blessed because of me somebody say God I see what you're saying this morning come on he points out the fact that the spiritual leaders of their day had completely failed God, completely failed the people, and completely failed to point them in the right direction. Do you know that I believe that it was a preacher many years ago that said, when the church fails, it is often a product of the fact that the pulpit has failed. <laughs> I am so fed up to my guts. I've seen people watering down the gospel, trying to appease the people that are hungry for carnality and the wrong things. But I wonder, is there anybody today that said, I want the spiritual meat and the milk and honey that flows from God? You can have all this other stuff that everybody thinks is heaven church. I want the real thing. Give me that oatmeal that flows from God. Give me that milk and honey that flows from heaven. That is what fortifies the soul and that's what we need in this day and hour. You see, the fact is uh, that the land of promise had now become defiled by their sinful, godless, self-centered choices. God said you have uh, you defiled the land and you've defiled your, your inheritance or your heritage. Uh, your children are gonna follow that. He's telling mamas and daddies uh, you shifted your focus from serving the Lord to everything else and your children are going to follow that example why is America in a shape well it's our president it's the gas prices it's inflation all of those things are a problem but let me tell you something folks the biggest problem in America is parents who won't raise their children to serve the Lord your example that you're leaving them let me ask you a question this ran through my mind today as I was preparing to get ready for church what kind of legacy are we leaving behind? 
Do you know that every person that dies, they will leave a legacy. It might be a very small one, but it will be a legacy of some sort. Is your legacy a splash in the pond or is your legacy one that your babies can look to and say, my mama loved God. My mama was faithful to God. Not just, well, my mama was a hard worker. She had a good work ethic. That's good because that helps pay the bills and that makes sure you can buy them a little toy here and there once in a while, put food on the table. All that's important. But if your boy can throw a three-point shot and make a perfect spiral, down the football field. What good is that if he dies and burns forever in hell? Come on, somebody. You better point your babies to God because that's going to be what lasts in eternity. Somebody say, help us all, Lord. The church world, the world in general is in trouble. But to keep this very simple, I want you to see that God had richly blessed them and right in the middle of the blessing, they failed to honor God with their ongoing devotion. They started out serving the Lord faithful. They started out with a mind of meekness and gentleness and a mind that loved God. But right in the middle of God's prosperity and God's blessing, they decided, you know what? I'm enjoying all this blessing. And it all became about them. That is about like God blessing your little business. And you making plenty of money doing what you do for a living. And you can go out and you can buy $50,000 trucks and $30,000 side-by-sides and, and then get mad because... And the Lord laid it on your heart to put $20 in an offering pan. See, God blessed you, and now all of a sudden, who is God? Well, y'all are quiet, but praise the Lord anyhow, I love you. Or that same business that God blessed you with that now keeps you from faithfully showing up to church. are awful quiet. If God blesses your business, you better make sure you are in return blessing God. Well, well, I'm making good money. We got a big house. We got a pool in the back. It's screened in. I just paid for new sod out front. Praise the Lord. But you better make sure that you reserve some days to bless the one that blessed you. Because there are a lot of folk that become vain. And you done forgot who it was you promised that you would serve faithfully. Because a lot of folk, well, I'm serving the Lord while I'm driving down the road. You know, I still listen to Z88. That's a good thing. Keep on listening to good music. But the best way to serve the Lord, the best way is to show your sacrificial devotion. What do you sacrifice for God? There are some folks in business, if somebody calls them on the phone, I need you to do this right now. They're like, well, uh, well, let me see. I'll drop everything I, I got going on right now. And, uh, I just, I'll, I'm going to have this birthday party. I, honey, I'll be back. I got to go, I got to go fix somebody's uh, ceiling fans falling down. You know what I'm saying? But if God dealt with you to have a prayer meeting, show up to church, be faithful, do anything for God, witness to somebody, give to a mission, I ain't dropping anything for that. I had this on, I've been planning to do this for two weeks. Because you become vain. Boy, y'all are awful quiet. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just telling you, this is the word of God. These people, they were meek and they were understanding. They were just so thankful. That's like that guy that, oh, I ain't had a job in six months. And God blessed them with an $18 an hour job. Now you let that $18 an hour job go to your head. And now you ain't faithful to God. Listen, if God blesses you with a job, God blesses you with a baby. If God blesses you with a house, if God blesses you with a car, man, you better make sure you pay homage back to the one that Bless you. Hey, you ever heard the saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. And so I got to put the shoe on this morning. As I stood over there and worshiped the Lord, my wife and I, 
I, I'm 50. I'll be 51 in October. I never had a place of my own. Never had my own house. We have lived there, lived there, lived whatever. I've never been able to say this is my home like I have now. I have been extremely blessed. I went from thinking I was on death's doorstep two or three years ago to all of a sudden now. I spent several hours at our home the other day, weed eating, mowing the grass, getting the place looking real nice. And I got some flowers out front with that pretty American flag flying out front. I try to bless my wife with something that looked real pretty. And so every time we pull up Sister Kim and I look at the place, I think, whoo, ain't God good. But as I stood there this morning, I began to think about all the promises and the blessings of God. Do I stop or am I so worried about me, myself, and I? It's about what I can get next, what I can do next. Am I giving God any, any payback by praise and worship? Am I trying to show God at any way of capacity how much I appreciate how God's blessed me? It's the same way that folks will say, God, I got to go before the judge next month, got a court date, and I need you to help me out. I'm facing 10 years in prison. And then they had their court date. God shows them mercy. They don't go to jail. They get probation. And six months later, who is God? Be out there back on the street, back in the trap house, back out there doping and smoking and back out there prostituting, back out there doing the same old junk that's doing before. Who is God? Well, if you forgot, you need to go back. God said, how have they forgotten me? I've been so good to them. You've got no time for me, but you've got time for everything else. It's high time for us to quit giving God a boatload of excuses. Oh, God, help all of us. Amen. So while you may not be that person, because I told you before, you know, a lot of folks, they think being vain, you know, that's just, that's all about the outward, you know. You might not be that girl, that guy that's posting 10 selfies a day on social media. You ain't got to be. You still be vain. Maybe you ain't walking around covered up in Gucci. Got a Gucci T-shirt. Got a Gucci belt, got some Gucci britches, got some Gucci shoes, huh? Still got a tag on it so everybody knows how much you paid for it, and it's the real thing. Got 30 gold chains like Mr. T. <laughs> come on, somebody. But if you ain't careful, you, come, you become just as vain as anybody else. Because the thing you worship now is you. You worship you. You see, some people think that worship is just what we do when our hands are raised. Worship has more to do with the way you live than it does the way you raise your hands. Are you sure, Pastor? Look it up for yourself. Worship is a thing of personal devotion. We're talking about praise versus worship. You can worship God by the way you treat the lady at Walmart checkout, the way you talk to the waitress at the restaurant. You can worship God and how you live. And the reason why some folks are missing the mark is because what they worship is self. They get a raise, the first thing they're thinking of. Well, I, I've been wanting to get one of them ball caps like that. I, I know it's $45. I've been wanting to get some of them hub caps like that put on my car. Like my grandpa, his vehicle looked like the flea market special. He had one of them birds and swans on the front of the hood with the big blue wings on it. The first thing you're thinking of is, what can I do to bless me? What can I do to feed me? What can I do to pamper me? What I like in that a lot, too, and I know this might be a little bit crazy because, you know, Pastor Myers, I got all kind of examples up here in my head. But to me, it reminds me a lot of like a woman who's poor or broke. You remember, you remember Reba McIntyre, the one that says something about a rope crawled across the floor and her high heel shoe or something? Huh? 
you poor and you broke. And Fancy got her a man. Fancy got took good care of. Fancy's living good. She eating caviar in place of spam, steak. She's taking good care of. And then after a couple years, Fancy gets established. And the next thing you know, she don't know who that guy is that rescued her out of the gutter. And she don't quite care anymore. She forgot where she came from. She forgot where she was whenever he found her. Y'all feel what I'm saying? I know I'm crazy. I'm glad God ain't crazy. But sometimes I wonder he had to be crazy to put up with some folks. I'm telling you because some of us can be real hard to deal with. But let me tell you something. If God has blessed you, rescued you, been there for you, what could I do? And I'm not just talking about money. That's a small portion of things. What could I do to reward or return the many manifold blessings of God? Yeah, or to bless other people. Do you know that I've preached this in the past, and I'm glad Brother Eric said that, because the truth is, of all the time I've been pastoring, the first thing sometimes people think about is if God blesses them with a big lump sum of money, whoa, this for me. We're going to get some movie tickets. We're going to pay $85 to go now and see a movie we shouldn't even probably be watching. I'm going to Ross. We're going to spend $285. I'm going to give me some shoes that might not fit, but they're on sale. I'm going, honey. God done blessed me. But what if... God blessed you with that lump sum because tomorrow you're going to run into somebody who can't pay the electric or you're going to run into somebody that's broke and needs help and God blessed you to bless somebody else. But whenever you're vain, you think about me all the time. Well, that's good preaching anyway. Somebody say, oh, I smell smoke in the air and it might be my own hide. Come on, somebody. I, I'm going to ask you, you know, why is it that we as a church, I know there's many different things, but why is it that we're not seeing God pour out his spirit like he has in the past? You ready for this? Because this is what the Lord dealt with me in prayer as I was seeking the Lord this morning. I can assure you, God is not going to pour out his, somebody say this, holy. Say it again, holy. God is not going to pour out his Holy Spirit on our unholy vanity. I forgot to pick up the Neosporin and the Band-Aids. We would have them in the foyer, but I can't help you this morning. But I can't close this message this morning without looking at what the Lord said in verse number 13. After all, we are preaching about these, this vanity and these leaking cisterns. I'm going to preach something you may have never heard before. You ready for this? For all of you like a little bit something, just a little bit deep, maybe never heard before? Well, here you go. He said in verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I have to admit to you, in the past, I missed this. I always visualize in my mind whenever the Bible talked about cisterns like clay pots like a clay pot that would be like a vase that would hold water. But that wasn't what the Bible was talking about. You see, I did a little bit of research, and this is both a literal and a spiritual implication. Sometimes God will do this in the Word. He'll take something literal, and he'll show you something spiritual as well. So let me show you the reason why I say that. From the literal aspect, I, just the best way I can show, show this to you, I want to read you what Matthew Henry's commentary said on this verse, and he writes this. They took great deal, a great deal of pains to hew themselves out cisterns to dig pits or pools in the earth or in rock which they would carry water to or which would be filled by rain. 
But they proved to be broken cisterns in that it had a false bottom so that they could not hold water. When they came to quench their thirst there, instead they found nothing but mud and mire and the filthy sediments of the standing lake. What was he saying in the literal form? What they would do is they would dig out. The modern day homesteaders would understand this. It's called a rain catchment system. So in other words, what that they would do is they would dig like ponds or they would dig man-made ditches. Remember in the Bible where it said, fill this valley full of ditches. They would dig out places in the earth. Sometimes in rock, they would carve out places with the attempt and the mindset that if I put this man-made place in the earth, that when it rains, it will fill it up and I'll have water for later. But what would often happen is they would dig these man-made places in the ground historically because this is what a a cistern is, basically a a retainage place. They dig this out, and when they would return to get water the next day, there might be less water. They come back another day, there's less water. Maybe on the third day they come back, and instead of any water, all they see is that uh, wet mud on the bottom of where they had dug it out because it has leaked back into the ground. It cannot hold any water. You see, what God was doing was God was taking something that the people of their day fully understood and he was also showing them that there was something different that they needed, something, a continuous supply. (laughs) A supply that when you come back next week, it'll be there. But what you currently have is leaking. You're living in vanity and you're living with a broken cistern, a broken leaking place that cannot hold water. Come on somebody and help me preach. But there are two common issues with a cistern that I want you to see. The first common issue is they are prone to leak and they are prone to run dry. The second issue is that they are not naturally occurring and they are man-made. This is not something God did. This is something that man did. I don't have time. I wish I could preach this. If I was in camp meeting, I'd preach another two hours. Uh, Their man-made attempt to hold the water. Their man-made attempt to live in happiness and bliss and peace and joy and to have a continuous supply. It would always run dry. Let me tell you, you can't buy enough raw shoes on sale. You can't buy enough clearance down at Belt Lindsay. You can't buy enough Big Macs and hamburgers and $50,000 vehicles uh, to keep a continuous flow of happiness in your life. Uh, But there is a flow that's white as snow. Uh, It's through the blood of Jesus Christ uh, and through the water of the Spirit. God said uh, to a woman down at a well side, the water that I have, uh, come on, you will never thirst again. Uh, There's water that'll never leak out, never run out, never dry out. It's the water of God. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. I want to shift your focus to a different alternative. I mentioned it briefly there, but I want you to shift your focus to a different alternative than a man-made cistern. Because some folks are trying to live life by making more money on a job. They're trying to find happiness. Well, the wife I got... She's overweight. I'm going to get me a skinnier one. Well, good chance you're going to get that skinny one going to treat you like the devil. Come on. Well, I'm going to get me a husband that can grow a beard. Huh? The one I got now can't. The one I got now ain't got no hair on his head. Get me a different one. You're in bad shape, Brother Coon. I don't know what I can't tell you. I'm going to get me a different one. Never happy with what they got. Always got to have something different. Folks like that are going to chase happiness their whole life and never be happy. They drive through the rich neighborhood, belly ache, moan, and gripe about how they ain't got what somebody else ain't got. Maybe you need to go on a mission trip and see folks living in ten rusty shacks with no roof on the top and be thankful for what you got with your little plants outside and everything's paid for. 
while that man in that big old house paying $20,000 every couple months for a mortgage payment. Somebody say, help me preach. Yeah, I'm going to tell the world like it is, and the fact of the matter is is that there's a lot of vain people. Oh, I may not be posting a bunch of selfies online. Look at me. I like this side of my face a little better. Let me Photoshop this so I don't got that freckle on the side of my head. Let me get rid of this zit on the side of my other side of my head. So everybody thinks that I'm so fantastic hottie. Why are you worried about being hottie? God's wondering whether you want to be holy. It is the difference that I want to show you. It's the difference between a cistern and a well. I mentioned it there with Jesus and the woman at the well. I believe that the well that God has is what we really need. Pastor, a lot of times it's uh, painful. Painful to watch people that you know are not fully sold out to God. Painfully watch them ride the roller coaster of Emotions, sad, broke down, miserable, need a kickstand, happy for a little while. Sad, broke down, miserable, need a kickstand, happy for a little while. And they're usually sad more than they are glad. And you know a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're living their life for the, same, for the wrong reasons. If they would just shift their focus and put their confidence in the well and not in a man-made cistern and make a big difference. I'm going to close with this two questions. And I'm going to take a little bit of time and slow down because I want these to sink down very deeply within your, in your soul. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano. Question number one, and I want you to apply this to you. Have you become vain and most everything has become about you in spite of how God has blessed you? It's what I like. It's what I don't like. It's what aggravates me. It's what makes me happy. Patmos is miserable. But what if God has you there for the revelation, the testimony of Jesus Christ? Is it about you or is it about God? Question number two, as I close and you stand to your feet, are you or have you been drinking from a man-made leaking cistern or the well that never runs dry if I could add a third question to that why are you always so miserable is it because though you want to believe God is everything in your life he is not let me tell you men and you women something maybe you're maybe you don't have a person in your life another significant other. If you chase people to give you affirmation and quit chasing God, anything that, anything that takes you further away from God and not closer to God is not of God. And that ain't popular and you may not hear that down the block somewhere else, but it's the truth. I wonder if there's any honest people in this service this morning honest enough to say, I got some things to pray about. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed across the church, you're not trying to figure out who's going, who's coming, who's staying, who's leaving. I wonder about you. God help me not to be vain. Lord, help it not to be all about what I feel, what I think. 
what pleases you? Are you pleased with me being in the situation, at the place, at the location that I'm in? Sometimes God will put a light in a very dark place. Because that dark place, the only light in there is the light of Christ in you. Sometimes that's miserable to be the only light on in a dark place. Sometimes that's hard. But I want to tell you, if it's the will of God, the most important, most valuable thing you can do is say, Lord, just as Jesus gave us the example, if it be thy will, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. When you pray like that, your attitude becomes, God, this is what I hope for. This is what I wish for. This is what I wish that would happen. But no matter what, I want your perfect will in my life, God. I need your perfect will in my life, God. I'm asking for your perfect will in my daily walk, God. Help me to be able to show my appreciation for all that I begged and pleaded and prayed. And then you bless me. And then I just completely fell off the rails, God. I, I didn't even take the time to really give you glory like I should have. Always complaining about what I got. Never really thankful for what I have. God, help us all. Quit doing so much belly aching, including me. Is that you? God, I'm sorry. When I should have been praising you, I was bombarding your complaint department. When I should have been saying, thank you, Lord, I was so busy complaining about everything instead of saying, you know what? Look how good you've been to me. I was too busy complaining. I know a lot of us have got a word straight from glory this morning, and you need to receive it. You need to apply it to your life. You need to take note of it, take thought of it, Take it with you this week. God, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. I realize where I've gone wrong, God. All of us want to prosper. All of us want to live in good health. But not all want to praise the Lord for what He does. Be the difference. Be the kind of people who are willing to say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be the kind of people that pull up in the driveway of your home, whether you rent it, lease it, borrow it, or buy it. And you say, thank you for this little place you let me live in. Be the kind of people that when you turn the key and it don't start right away, you say, thank you, Lord, that I got a car in the first place. It may not run as well as I wish it did. Thank you for this. I said, well, I ain't even got a car yet. I just got a bicycle. You better thank God for the bicycle. Because I guarantee you there's someone out there footing it with lefty and righty somewhere who's, who's walking miles just to get to a place to get some water. Every time you go to that water faucet and get you a drink of water or get a water bottle out of the refrigerator, thank God because there's people in other places drinking dirty water every day trying to filter it out so they can drink it and don't die. And yet we complain about the smallest little things. I can't stand this washing detergent, honey. Why you always buy this garbage detergent? Better be glad you got something to wash your clothes with. There's some folks over in other places that are washing it out in mud puddles, wearing their clothes four and five days at a time, and they think that's normal because that's the life they, 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 they were given. Just how good has God been to you? And do you praise Him like you should? I may not have much, but I want to thank you for what little bit I got. It wasn't what I had in mind five years ago, Pastor, but I'm thankful for what anyway. Lord, this morning I have done everything I could possibly think of to obey you. And I have preached what I felt you laid in my heart. And I ask you on the way to church this morning to please smile down on it. And I believe you've answered, and I believe you're, you're doing exactly what I ask. 
I'm asking you to continue to water the seeds that have been planted. I'm asking you to continually this morning to give the increase of what has already been planted and watered. And I pray, God, you'll make a difference in our life. God, help us to accept the challenge and evaluate our own lives through the Spirit. God, if there's any change that needs to take place in our lives, God, help us to make the change. Help us to make the changes. And more importantly, help us to stick with the changes. In the name of Jesus, amen. I hope and pray this morning that when you leave this church, you can say, wow, God spoke to me this morning and I feel like I have been in his presence and I'm leaving with a different perspective. I want you to pray for yourself, pray for your family, pray for your church. Please don't forget, throughout the week, if you get a prayer request,